verses 22 to 24. We have here the result of Paul's trial before Felix, and what was the consequence of it. Felix adjourned the cause, and took further time to consider of it. V22 He had a more perfect knowledge of that way which the Jews called heresy than the high priest and the elders thought he had. He understood something of the Christian religion, for, living at Caesarea, where Cornelius, a Roman centurion, was, who was a Christian, from him and others he had got a notion of Christianity, that it was not such an evil thing as it was represented. He himself knew some of that way to be honest good men, and very conscientious, and therefore he put off the prosecutors with an excuse, when the chief captain shall come down hither, I will know the uttermost of your matter, or I shall know the truth, whether this Paul did go about to raise sedition or no, you are parties, he is an indifferent person. Either Paul deserves to be punished for raising the tumult, or you do for doing it yourselves and then charging it upon him, and I will hear what he says, and determine accordingly between you. It was a disappointment to the high priest and the elders that Paul was not condemned, or remitted to their judgment, which they wished for and expected. But thus sometimes God restrains the wrath of his people's enemies by the agency, not of their friends, but of such as are strangers to them. And though they be so, if they have but some knowledge of their way, they cannot but appear for their protection. It was an injury to Paul that he was not released. Felix ought to have avenged him of his adversaries when he so plainly saw there was nothing but malice in the prosecution, and to have delivered him out of the hand of the wicked, according to the duty of a judge, PS 82 4. But he was a judge that neither feared God nor regarded man, and what good could be expected from him. It is a wrong not only to deny justice, but to delay it. He detained the prisoner in custody, and would not take bail for him else here at Caesarea Paul had friends enough that would gladly have been his security. Felix thought a man of such a public character as Paul was had many friends, as well as many enemies, and he might have an opportunity of obliging them, or making a hand of them, if he did not presently release him, and yet did show him countenance, and therefore. He continued him a prisoner, commanded a centurion or captain to keep him, v. 23. He did not commit him to the common jail, but, being first made an army prisoner, he shall still be so. Yet he took care he should be a prisoner at Larg and Libera Custodia, his keeper must let him have liberty, not bind him nor lock him up, but make his confinement as easy to him as possible, let him have the liberty of the castle, and, perhaps, he means liberty to take the air, or go abroad upon his parole and Paul was such an honest man that they might take his word for his return. The high priest and the elders grudged him his life, but Felix generously allows him a sort of liberty, for he had not those prejudices against him and his way that they had. He also gave orders that none of his friends should be hindered from coming to him, the centurion must not forbid any of his acquaintances from ministering to him, and a man's prison is as it were his own house if he has but his friends about him. He had frequent conversation with him afterwards in private, once particularly, not long after his public trial, v. 24, 25. With what design Felix sent for Paul? He had a mind to have some talk with him concerning the faith in Christ, the Christian religion, he had some knowledge of that way, but he desired to have an account of it from Paul, who was so celebrated a preacher of that faith, above the rest. Those that would enlarge their knowledge must discourse with men of their own profession, and those that would be acquainted with any profession should consult those that excel in the knowledge of it, and therefore Felix had a mind to talk with Paul more freely than he could in open court, where he observed Paul upon his guard, concerning the faith of Christ, and this only to satisfy his curiosity, or rather the curiosity of his wife Drusilla, who was a Jewess, daughter of Herod Agrippa, that was eaten of worms. Being educated in the Jewish religion, she was more inquisitive concerning the Christian religion, which pretended to be the perfection of that, and desired to hear Paul discourse of it. But it was no great matter what religion she was of, for, whatever it was, she was a reproach and scandal to it a Jewess, but an adulteress, she was another man's wife when Felix took her to be his wife, and she lived with him in whoredom and was noted for an impudent woman yet she desires to hear concerning the faith of Christ. 
Many are fond of new notions and speculations in religion, and can hear and speak of them with pleasure, who yet hate to come under the power and influence of religion, can be content to have their judgments informed but not their lives reformed. What the account was which Paul gave him of the Christian religion, by the idea he had of it, he expected to be amused with a mystical divinity, but, as Paul represents it to him, he is alarmed with a practical divinity. Paul, being asked concerning the faith in Christ, reasoned, for Paul was always a rational preacher, concerning righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. It is probable that he mentioned the peculiar doctrines of Christianity concerning the death and resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and his being the mediator between God and man, but he hastened to his application, in which he designed to come home to the consciences of his hearers. He discoursed with clearness and warmth of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, and here he showed that the faith in Christ is designed to enforce upon the children of men the great laws of justice and temperance. The grace of God tiak hate us to live soberly and righteously. Justice and temperance were celebrated virtues among the heathen moralists, if the doctrine Paul preaches, which Felix has heard of as proclaiming liberty, will but free him from an obligation to these, he will readily embrace it, no, says Paul, it is so far from doing so that it strengthens the obligations of those sacred laws, it binds all under the highest penalties to be honest in all their dealings, and to render to all their due, to deny themselves, and to keep under the body, and bring it into subjection. The world and the flesh being in our baptism renounced, all our pursuits of the world and all our gratifications of the desires of the body are to be under the regulations of religion. Paul reasoned of righteousness and temperance, to convince Felix of his unrighteousness and intemperance, of which he had been notoriously guilty, that, seeing the odiousness of them, and his obnoxiousness to the wrath of God for them, f5 colon 6, he might inquire concerning the faith of Christ, with a resolution to embrace it. That by the doctrine of Christ is discovered to us the judgment to come, by the sentence of which the everlasting state of all the children of men will be finally and irreversibly determined. Men have their day now, Felix hath his, but God's day is coming, when everyone shall give account of himself to God, the judge of all. Paul reasoned concerning this, that is, he showed what reason we have to believe that there is a judgment to come, and what reason we have, in consideration thereof, to be religious. From this account of the heads of Paul's discourse we may gather that Paul in his preaching had no respect to persons, for the word of God, which he preached, has not, he urged the same convictions and instructions upon the Roman governor that he did upon other people. That Paul in his preaching aimed at the consciences of men, and came close to them, sought not to please their fancy nor to gratify their curiosity, but led them to a sight of their sins and a sense of their duty and interest. That Paul preferred the serving of Christ, and the saving of souls, before his own safety. He lay at the mercy of Felix, who had power, as Pilate said, to crucify him, or, which was as bad, to deliver him back to the Jews, and he had power to release him. Now when Paul had his ear, and had him in a good humor, he had a fair opportunity of ingratiating himself with him, and obtaining a release, nay, and of incensing him against his prosecutors, and, on the contrary, if he disobliged him, and put him out of humor, he might do himself a great discontentness by it, but he is wholly negligent of these considerations, and is intent upon doing good, at least discharging his duty. That Paul was willing to take pains, and run hazards, in his work, even where there was little probability of doing good. Felix and Drusilla were such hardened sinners that it was not at all likely they should be brought to repentance by Paul's preaching, especially under such disadvantages, and yet Paul deals with them as one that did not despair of them. Let the watchmen give fair warning, and then they have delivered their own souls, though they should not prevail to deliver the souls they watch for. What impressions Paul's discourse made upon this great but wicked man, Felix trembled, Amphibos Genominos being put into a fright, or made a terror to himself, a Magermis Abib, as Pashur. Paul never trembled before him, but he was made to tremble before Paul. If this be so, as Paul says, what will become of me in another world? If the unrighteous and intemperate will be condemned in the judgment to come, 
I am undone, forever undone, unless I lead a new course of life. We do not find that Drusilla trembled, though she was equally guilty, for she was a Jewess, and depended upon the ceremonial law, which she adhered to the observance of, to justify her, but Felix for the present could fasten upon nothing to pacify his conscience, and therefore trembled. The power of the word of God, when it comes with commission, it is searching, it is startling, it can strike a terror into the heart of the most proud and daring sinner, by setting his sins in order before him, and showing him the terrors of the Lord. The workings of natural conscience, when it is startled and awakened, it fills the soul with horror and amazement at its own deformity and danger. Those that are themselves the terror of the mighty in the land of the living have hereby been made a terror to themselves. A prospect of the judgment to come is enough to make the stoutest heart to tremble, as when it comes indeed it will make the mighty men and the chief captains to call in vain to rocks and mountains to shelter them. Thank you.